Love the Truth Media, a teaching ministry of Pastor Steve Wiseman of Pee Wee Valley Baptist Church in Pee Wee Valley, Kentucky. To learn more about the many resources available through this ministry, visit us online at lovethetruthmedia.com. And now, here's Pastor Steve to continue our verse-by-verse study in the book of 2 Peter. We're in 2 Peter chapter 2. And last week we took a look at verse 4. We spent uh, two or three weeks in the first three verses, a week in verse 4, and now we're going to take a look at uh, verses 5 through 9, but we won't get through all of those tonight. But we'll, um, we'll, we'll set a course in that direction, and as long as the Lord tarries, uh, Lord willing, we'll come back and, and pick up where we leave off tonight. And uh, just uh, follow along at the reading of God's Word, if you will. Beginning in, let's, let's, in fact, let's, uh, let's go back to verse 1, and we'll read verses 1 through 9. But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And many shall follow their pernicious ways, uh, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. And through covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you, whose judgment now for a long time lingereth not, and their uh, damnation slumbereth not. For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell, and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment, and spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an ensample unto those that after should live ungodly. And delivered just Lot, vexed with filthy uh, conversation um, of the wicked, for that righteous man dwelling among them and seeing and hearing vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptation and to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. Father, we thank you uh, for this passage of Scripture, the entirety of your counsel. Uh, Father, we, we come tonight that we might submit to it, surrender to it, um, that we would commit to it. And Father, as you teach and guide us, may we be committed to not only uh, hearing, but also to following that which you say, putting what we hear into action in our lives. Um, And Father, we just simply thank you for bringing us together tonight, asking you, Father, to bless those who wanted to be here and yet are unable for whatever providential hindrance they have. And Father, we ask that you would convict the hearts of those who should be here and are not. We'll give you thanks and praise for all of this, for it's in Christ's name we ask it. Amen. Now, um, I do want to be a little, do another little bit of review tonight, because uh, I, I want to make sure we don't leave this section. Now, we're going to be talking about false teachers well into chapter 2, um, and it uh, looks like all of chapter uh, 2. Uh, and false teaching, in the average Christian's perspective, uh, is not considered uh, to be as serious as it should. It's, it's, it's really bad stuff. Uh, and that's really the gist of the first half of this second chapter uh, that Peter's gave to us in the second epistle. False teaching uh, is, is as bad as it gets. And that's, that's simply put. It's as bad as it gets. Uh, and we're going to see that as we go through a little bit of review and get into particularly verses 5 and uh, seven, 6 and 7 tonight. But uh, the first thing I want to do is I laid out an outline for, the, um, for, for uh, this. I don't have one to hand out. But... Uh, what we what we've seen in the first three verses are false teachers. Now, what we're going to see in verses ten through sixteen is a more detailed description of false teachers. 
we have the characterization of them in the first couple of verses uh, and in the first half of verse 3. The interesting thing is that um, at, the, at the end of verse 1, uh, concerning these false prophets and false teachers, and there are many of them according to the Scriptures, at the end of verse 1 it says, um, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. These false teachers bring upon themselves swift destruction. Verse 3, at the middle and to the end of the verse, says about these false teachers, whose judgment now for a long time lingereth not, uh, and their damnation slumbereth not. And then what we find in the next few verses concerns what their destruction looks like. But uh, So we're going to talk, uh, last week we talked about how it looks like the fallen angels. And tonight we're going to talk about the world of the ungodly in the days of Noah. And we're going to talk about Sodom and Gomorrah. And how that they are given as an example of what these false teachers are going to suffer. And when you think about what you know about the fallen angels, which we spent uh, last uh, week talking about, and, and what you know about... Um, uh, Noah's day when the flood was brought upon by God himself and the days of Sodom and Gomorrah those are pretty significant events in biblical history false teaching is compared to those that's how serious it is now let's review again just quickly about these false teachers uh, that we found and 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 what, what their characterization looks like. And uh, these false teachers, it says in the end of verse 3, two things about them that I want to point out, and that is, whose judgment now for a long time lingereth not, and their, damnable, um, and their uh, damnation slumbereth not. Two things, that is judgment, and this word damnation literally means destruction in our language today. So judgment and destruction judgment and destruction is reserved for them um, and and the way that's pointed out is they're going to suffer the judgment and the destruction of God because God didn't spare the fallen angels God didn't spare uh, the wicked world in the days of Noah God didn't spare uh, the, the inhabitants of Sodom and Gomorrah and he's not going to spare the false teachers that's really the principle here. He's not going to spare the false teachers. Why? Uh, and we see there in, in verse 1, um, and, and what we see here, understand that it's not just a matter of preference. And that's, that's what I think so many Christians are. They prefer not to go to this church, but to go to that church. And why? Well, you know, maybe they don't exactly teach the right thing over there. We ought to be as astute uh, in the Scriptures as the Bereans were, and we ought to be examining the Scriptures daily to see whether or not what we're hearing is the Word of God or if it's somebody's opinion. Because opinions about what God has to say uh, is very, very dangerous. And so what we see by way of behavior of false teachers is extremely severe behavior. It's severe behavior. And we take it too lightly in our Christian community. We take it too lightly. Uh, and if we know somebody's going to a church or in a denomination where there's error, we don't try to rescue them out of that. According to uh, verse 2, it says, Many shall follow their pernicious ways. Many are going to follow them. And the same thing's true in our society today. There are many people who are following false teachers. And um, we need to understand how serious and grave the situation is regarding false teachers. Now we saw there in verse 1, first thing is, again, they lie. They lie. It says in verse 1, but there were false prophets. False means they're not true. It means they're lying. Uh, they're faking it. Uh, they're masquerading as, as true prophets, if you will. And also among uh, the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who what? Privily men secretly shall bring in um, damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves self-destruct. So they're false. They're liars. 
They're liars. You say, well, everything they say isn't a lie. Let me ask this question. How many lies does a false teacher have to purport before you think it's serious? <laughs> one. Yeah, I see. One. One. That's all it takes. A lie is a lie. Now, and people say, well, you know, it, 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 it doesn't seem that serious to me. When you consider the judgment, the judgment and the destruction they're going to receive because they're lying and doing some other things, it's as bad as the days of Noah. It's as bad as the fallen angels. It's as bad as the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. Those were given as examples of what's going to happen to these false teachers. They're lying. One lie is enough. One lie. Now, they're lying, and we see that there, but here's what happens. It says here, this is, a, this is a phrase, and I've been over it a couple of times already, but I want to go over it again because I really believe we got to get this. They secret, this word privily means secretly. Um, that means that they bring it in so that you're not aware of it. And they, and they mask it with some good stuff. Maybe with great oration, maybe with some drama presentations, uh, maybe to pulling it out of context to put their own spin on it. But somehow they cover it up. They cover it up. It's intentional. Don't think that it's just because they made a mistake. It's intentional. Because this, this, this phrasing here of destructive heresies, um, and you see it in the... King James uh, Bible as damnable heresies, literally they're destructive heresies. Remember that heresies, and, and we think about heretical teaching. So what is heresy? There's one word that I've given over and over again about heresy. It's an opinion. It's an opinion. That's what the word means in the Greek. It means an opinion. So we see the word heresy, it's an opinion about God. It's an opinion about the Word. It's an opinion about an idea, a principle, or a thought. It's just, it's just an opinion. And, what it, and how it's characterized here is their opinions, their opinions that, that will bring destruction. That's how bad they are. That's how serious the situation is. Now, these opinions are <clears throat> come from self. So it's what, it's what we want to think. The Bible gives us a truth. And what we want to do is we really don't want what the Bible says to be the truth. What we want to be the truth is what fits in with our lifestyle, our opinion. We want something that fits our opinion. Because there are some things that we like in this world that we really haven't given up. Now we're going to study a little bit about Genesis um, you know, chapter 19 about Sodom and Gomorrah, and there's a passage there about Lot's wife. When Lot and his family were delivered out of Sodom and Gomorrah, Lot's wife looked back because she was still interested in some stuff. She couldn't give that stuff up. That's where her heart was. That's why God destroyed her, turned her into a pillar of salt. And we're still looking back by taking what the Bible says and just misshaping it a little bit. We're going to talk about that again. Misshaping it a little bit so that it doesn't appear to be quite as strong. Now somebody, maybe it was one of you this morning, we're talking about the old hymns. Um, maybe it was uh, Jenny, I don't know, yeah. Um, and where I, I mentioned this morning, and, I, and I, I wasn't mindful when I thought about it, where it says that Jesus came and died for such a worm as I. And how that some authors have taken that song and put such as such a one as I. And that's just an example. That's not, a, that's not scripture, but the principle is scriptural. And the Bible says we're wicked sinners. Well, the world doesn't want to think of themselves as being wicked or sinful or characterized by a worm. They want to think, of, I'm a person. So as bad as one like me, or that he came and died for one like me. It sort of doesn't make me look so bad. Somehow we're trying to protect ourselves and our dignity. Without Christ, we have no dignity. We don't have any. It's self-made. So what this opinion is by way of heresy 
It's a self-willed opinion that people substitute for the truth of God's Word. Because the God's Word is the truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So the Word is the truth. And anything that's different than that is man's opinion of it. And when you hear, and I, and I often do when people are preaching, and they'll refer to some extra-biblical work, some book, some poem, some song, and they'll quote it. How many preachers have ever heard they preach out of a hymn book? And I've heard it so often. Only, it's only accurate if the hymn book, hymn book is given us scriptural principles that are accurate and true. So we're always best to stick with the Word. Guess what? I've been preaching now for 27 years. Actually, almost 30. I haven't run out of material yet. <laughs> I haven't had to go find another book to teach. I haven't had to do it. But, so, they're lying and they're substituting their own opinions for the truth of God's Word. That's what that uh, heresy is talking about there in verse 1. And it says at the end of verse 1 that they even deny the Lord. When you deny the truth, you deny the Lord because the Lord is the truth. The Lord is the Word. So when you twist it or pervert the truth, you have denied God. You have. Because you've denied His authority. You've denied His perfection. Because you've decided in your own mind to be an editor of God's Word and say, this is what it says. And that's why so many people are protective about the translation of the Bible that they use. Because there are some translations out there, I mean, that just paraphrase it. They're not translations. They don't go back to the original languages and translate it into our language. They just sort of write a story around the Scripture that sounds good, and people say, oh, it's so much easier to understand. It's like a story when I read it. But it's not the truth. What we need desperately is the truth. And false teachers that come in teaching something that's not the truth, it is very, very dangerous for themselves as well as for those that follow them. In verse 2, uh, we see this um, absence of restraint. That's what this pernicious word pernicious means. There's no restraint. There's, there's no, they don't feel that there's any restriction or constraint upon what they do or say. They can just pretty much say what they want to say. Because how many people have you seen take the Bible, and I told you about this one guy, he'd get up, and he would stand right beside the thing, and he would read a passage of Scripture, and he'd lay his Bible down open like this. And then he'd go preach for 40 minutes. He didn't ever go back and refer to the Word. Um, and although there were good stories and there was good biblical content, I cannot say that he always taught the truth. And so, but it sounded good. And you would look at him and say, this guy is very polished and he speaks very well. But when you got the word over there somewhere, uh, <laughs> you'll never go wrong with the word because the power's in the word. But when you start relying upon some other stuff, look out. And there's a lot of folks out there that just love to tell stories. And people leave the building remembering the stories. And you say, well, as long as it gives the principle, if people leave the building remembering the story and not the principle, something's wrong with the teaching. So I don't want you ever to leave the building remembering a good story I told. I don't ever, I, I, I truly try to guard against that. Because I don't want you knowing, thinking that I've got something that, that is going to give you more truth than what the Word's going to give you. And that's why I stick to the Bible. You don't hear me pulling a lot of other works out or books or anything else and talking about those. On a rare occasion I will if I believe that it really accurately reflects the truth of God's Word. Because as I speak it, every word that I say doesn't come out of the Scripture. So somebody can write and do the same thing. And there are some good works out there. There are some good commentaries. There are some good writings. And I understand that. And I'm not, but what we need to do is I believe every time I come to the pulpit or the lectern and teach the Word of God, that God is the one who's teaching the lesson. Yep, I got a page with a few scribbles on it there. And if you know, if you know me and look at me long enough, you know I don't look at my notes very often. 
Um, and, but I write them down and sort of organize my thoughts a little bit, and I study it. And when I get here, it's going to be what the Lord wants delivered. It's not, and I never think, I never even think about what I'm going to say when I get here. I don't do that. What I do is I put the principles down, and then I let the Lord do the thinking for me. And I think that's what we need more of. Is not, not that I'm a perfect example, but I believe we need to get into the Word of God and let people come fresh and new into, a, into the assembly of the believers with, a, with the Word of God as, as the only source of information because that's where we get the truth. And anytime we start mixing something else up and people will give you authors' names, you'll hear many, many times if I ever say anything like I read about an author, I don't give you a name. Uh, and I'm not plagiarizing, but I'll just mention a thought. I'm not giving a long passage, but I'll give a thought about what somebody has said. Usually I do that in the context that I don't really think that's what the word says. But there are a lot of people out there that tell you things. They surmise things. So they're lying. Uh, they're giving their own opinions. They're denying the Lord. And they don't, have, they don't feel there's any restraint on what they're doing. And this um, perniciousness uh, speaks of wantonness. And even borders on indecency. And when you, when you consider that it's lying about the Word of God in false teaching, it is indecent. That's my opinion of it. Now, um, and that's God's opinion. Now, when you take a look at verse 2 again, it says, They're leading others astray. Many shall follow them. So they have a, they have a price to pay for misleading God's people or any other people. And, um, as we saw there at the end of verse 2, they're speaking bad things about the truth. If you're going to teach false doctrine, then you have to say bad things about the truth. Because you're trying to make what your opinion is look good. And so there are people who say, well, you know, and they sort of water it down and push things aside. They'll maybe... And how many people really and truly do you hear going through the scriptures verse by verse not many they're dealing with topical sermons and although topical sermons can be good uh, what you have to guard against is are they really preaching the word because i've heard some go from genesis to revelation in one sermon and and it's like i'm not sure how all this fits in uh, not that they teach every verse in between the beginning and the end, but they'll mention a passage here, a passage there, and a passage there. And sometimes I'm wondering, okay, what, how did we get here? Where, where did we start? And when you take the verses verse by verse, <clears throat> you have to have them in context. When I keep going back to the beginning of a chapter and bring us up to date, I'm trying to make sure we have everything in context. I don't want it to get out of context because the truth is so important. So now, but they're speaking... Uh, uh, bad things, they're mocking and ridiculing the church and the people who believe the truth and the people who are adhering to the truth. In verse 3, they're covetous. That means their desire is to have more. They have this insatiable desire that will never be satisfied to have more. Uh, it's greed. And here's the, here's the thing. When we saw in verse 1 that they privily, that is secretly bring in these destructive opinions... Um, and combine that with the fact that, and there's a phrase here in verse 3, with feigned words they make merchandise of you. Through covetousness, through a desire to have more, through a greedy appetite that can't be satisfied, they're trying to make merchandise how? Through feigned words. Now, feigned means that they're untrue. That sort of goes along with verse 1, that they're teaching false doctrine. But this word feigns means carefully constructed. And so what they do is there's, um, and I know there's some churches around, and, and they, they plan and scheme from the beginning of the end to accomplish some means. And when they get to the end, I'm wondering, where's the biblical principle here? They've got a principle. I'm not sure it's a biblical principle. They strayed somewhere along the way. But what the scripture says, false teachers will make a plan because the word says one thing and you've got to twist it and distort it and pervert it in order to get something else out of it. And we know that that's what false teachers are doing. So it says here what they're doing is in verse 3, they're using these shaped or formed or carefully constructed words and phrases to get you there. 
Now you think this, well, it just happens. It doesn't just happen. This is a plan of the devil. Don't think there's not a spiritual warfare going on. And there are people who are guided by the devil. There are people who, you're either serving God or you're serving the devil. Who do you think the false teachers are serving? They're not serving God. So if they're serving the devil, uh, and you say, well, but they know the word, there's just, no, they don't, yeah, even the devil. When Jesus came out from his sabbatical, uh, before he went into public ministry, what did the devil do? He used some verses of scripture on him. So the devil can quote verses of scripture. And he even knows enough about them to take them out of context and twist them a little bit or change one or two words that would change the significance and the meaning of the principle. That's what false teachers do. They carefully construct their wordings. And I know there are people in high profile ministry positions and they read every word. They got them on a monitor, they got them here, they got everything laid out and they carefully construct what they say. And there are some big, high-profile preachers that aren't anywhere close to the truth as well. And we know who most of those are. I don't need to mention any names there. But they're lavishing it upon themselves by making merchandise of people in the church. And their, their motives are not to please God. Their motives are covetousness. That's what the Scripture tells us there. They have a different motive. Um... And I was talking to somebody, um, I think it was uh, somebody that I was talking to at, uh, when I was bowling on Thursday morning, I, and, and one of them was saying, you know the, 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 the pay for preachers is skyrocketing these days? I said, no, I wouldn't have any idea about that, because I don't try to keep track of it, and it doesn't matter to me. But it matters to me to know that people are taking such huge advantage, and I understand that, that those who handle the Word of God are due double honor. I do understand that. But there's a point at which you go beyond what the Lord's providing for you to go on and get more than that. And that's what the false teachers, they've, they've got it in their own mind. And so if you see somebody living in lavish, lavish environment, you might want to take a look at the ministry and see whether or not they're preaching the truth. What you'll find is a Berean studier of the word, they're not going to be preaching the truth. So... <clears throat> try to get to our lesson here so understanding that so we have these false teachers that are characterized in verses one through three and the fact that they're going to be judged and that they're going to be uh, destroyed uh, leads us to the comparisons that God gives us because God did not spare in some similar situations so before we look at that though this in verse 3b this word judgment uh, that we see here, it says um, these false teachers in the middle of verse 3, whose judgment, so what is this judgment? That is a sentence that is pronounced on somebody. These false teachers will have a sentence pronounced upon them. We call it a verdict. People go to court and they get a verdict. Innocent or guilty or I guess not guilty. They don't ever declare anybody innocent in the court. They don't. They declare them not guilty. They don't say you're innocent of the crime. They just say there's not an evid enough evidence to, guilt to convict you of being guilty. Well, guess what? It doesn't take a court in this land to make a mistake on this issue. God is the one who is judging. And I know people are very concerned about judging. Uh, but judging is, a, is appropriate for all believers in certain circumstances. There are some inappropriate things regarding judgment for believers but by and large we are expected to judge other people's lives we are i mean even church discipline requires judgment of somebody else's life by more than the pastor and the leader in the church It's by every congregant everybody has a responsibility to look at somebody else's life and judge whether or not the behavior is consistent with the word of god and we have a responsibility individually to do something about it and there are other scriptures. We read uh, through First and Second Timothy, Paul instructed Timothy, and over in First John, where, God, where John has instructed in, in, in chapter 4, in the first few verses, that we are to try the spirits, uh, examine the spirits, see whether or not they confess. The spirit confesses. We see people's mouths confess. We hear it. 
And we see them going to church and we see these appearances. But despite all of that, yes, we are to judge whether or not their spirit confesses the Lord Jesus. Why? Because there's a lot of antichrist running around. And we've got to be careful about that, right? Or we'll be one of the ones following these false teachers. So we have to judge. But we've got to be biblical judgment. When it says in Matthew 7, 1, judge not that you be not judged, it's talking about the judgment that's hypocritical judgment. That's selfish judgment. It's, uh, you might call it backbiting. We're looking at somebody else and say, well, look at them. Look what they're doing. And say, well, you're not supposed to judge me. Well, you know what? Believers are supposed to be the light of the world. That means that the light of the world is Christ. And we are a reflection of that light. And what does the light do? The light exposes darkness. That's sin. So we are to expose sin. If you're exposing somebody's sin, guess what? They call you a judge. They can call us what they want. But we have biblical obligations to do that stuff. But this judgment is a verdict that God's going to hand down. And it's a verdict of condemnation on false teachers. As we're going to see as we go through these next few verses. And uh, the next piece there uh, in the end of verse 3. that says that um, judgment now for a long time lingereth not and their damnation. The word damnation means destruction. I'll say two things about destruction. And that is, um, as defined uh, in, in the Greek dictionary, this word that is used, destruction here, is not loss of being, but it's loss of well-being. We've said that many times. People don't cease to exist. Every person that's ever lived on top side of earth will live eternally. Now, live is a word that's used loosely there. Because those who don't know Christ as Savior, they're going to die eternally. But literally, they will have existence in the lake of fire through a body that cannot be destroyed or disintegrated by the fire, but yet they will experience all the pain as a body would today in a fire. We know how excruciating that pain is. And that's an eternal life in the lake of fire. Uh, And, of course, believers go on to live eternally with the Lord. So everybody lives eternally one way or another. So this destruction is not loss of being. You're always going to exist. It's a loss of well-being. It's the idea of uh, ruin and not extinction. There's no extinction with people and their souls and their spirit. Never to be extinguished. So, with all this in mind, uh, we go... And turn our attention to verse 5. Having looked at verse 4, and that is about the fallen angels, uh, what we found there is that God did not spare them. And it said, the first word of verse 4 is for. And, And that answers the question why, or since, if you will, because... What it says at the end of verse 3 is these false teachers are going to suffer judgment. And in the end of verse 1, it says that swift destruction is going to come upon them. There's a judgment coming. There's a verdict coming. And they're going to be condemned. And they're going to be sent to an eternal fiery pit uh, that is designed for the devil and the fallen angels. And all the false teachers are going to end up there too. Now, so for this false teaching... Comparable destruction is like that of the fallen angels we talked about last week. They're not going to be spared because God didn't spare the fallen angels. And in verse 5, to begin our text verse for tonight, and he spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. Now we've got to go back to Genesis chapter 6 to look at this world of the ungodly. Well, somebody started playing drums there for a minute. The world of the ungodly. Are we living in a world of ungodliness? Well, one, one way we can tell is to look at this scripture. We can do that. And what we also understand is the destruction and demise of these false teachers is certain, just like it is for the fallen angels, and just like it was for this old world in Noah's time. Look at uh, Genesis chapter 6 and verse 5. And you'll see there, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination and the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Um, And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. 
And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, and, and the creeping thing, and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. Okay, one thing we see here uh, is, um, it says in the first part of verse 5, what were the conditions of the world at that time that gave Peter the authority under the inspiration of God to call it an ungodly world? The first thing we see is widespread wickedness. Does that sound like today? Widespread wickedness. It's in every corner of our society and of, of our world. It says in verse part of verse 5, and God saw it. God saw it. Man doesn't always see the truth of the situation, but God does. And here's what God saw. God saw that the wickedness of man uh, was great in the earth. The word great means it was abundant. It means it was abundant. That's why I called it widespread wickedness. Uh, Mary and I sit there before the TV almost every night at at the 11 o'clock news or the 6 o'clock news, whatever it might be, the 4.30 news. It seemed like they got news on almost most of the day now, even on the local news affiliates. And we look at each other and comment about how serious conditions are here in Louisville. And here's what we've seen. I mean, I've lived in 13 different states, but just, just getting here, uh, when we moved to Cleveland from, from Virginia, uh, things were bad. It, it, there's a side of Cleveland... And they told Mary when she went to work in downtown Cleveland, because she had to work on the east side, said, you don't want to go to that neighborhood. Matter of fact, I drove her to work one day. For some reason, I'm driving down the street, and she says, this is one of the streets they told us not to go down. <laughs> it's really bad. We moved to Detroit, and when we moved to Detroit, we were there in 2000 and 2001. It was the number one murder capital of the U.S. So we moved to St. Louis. The year we moved to St. Louis in 2002, St. Louis became the number one murder capital of the United States. Because East St. Louis is included in the St. Louis metropolitan area, even though East St. Louis is a different city and it's in a different state. It's a metropolitan area. It's sort of like Kentuckiana. Uh, but when you go across the river, yeah, Mary and I, we, we call it Indiucky. We just reverse the word, right? But when you go across the river uh, to New Albany and, and was it Jeffersonville, not Jefferson Town, when you go to the cities over, they're included in the metropolitan area, even though they're in a different state. So we go to St. Louis and it's the number one murder capital. Mary has to go down to work, uh, downtown to work every day. And when she goes down there, um, you know, I, I say don't park anywhere but in the garage. One day, a couple of days, I think she parked in the surface lot and she almost got... Uh, accosted by a couple of criminals there. Didn't find out that we got home that that's exactly who they were. But she was watching. She ran to the car and got in it and it was okay. But it was the number one murder capital. So then, of course, we move here and I went down to New Orleans. And the, the year I went down there in 2007, New Orleans was the murder capital of the U.S. It seems like they followed us wherever we went. I'm serious about this. The murder capital. And I remember I was only there Tuesday through Friday. That was it. And, and not every week, but I was there Tuesday through Friday. I flew home Friday night. I went back Monday night, and I was there Tuesday through Friday. When I went back on Monday night, it was always late. I didn't get to the hotel at midnight, a little after. So I didn't really see the news to the next afternoon, Tuesday afternoon. And I heard about all these murders, all these shootings, all these knifings. And it was just incredible. The crime that happens in New Orleans. And now we look at each other and you know, Louisville's not a pretty picture right now. It's not the murder capital of the United States. But if the pace of change accelerates much more, it's going to be a contender. Because what we're seeing is, and so having been in all these areas and all these different states... And here, I mean, I always heard at Gary, Indiana, that was the worst place to be. And I remember when I used to travel to Chicago from Norfolk, my boss who was from Chicago said, don't ever go on the east side of Chicago, nowhere on the east side of Chicago. Well, Mary and I ended up on there one day. Sure enough, we go to Chicago, and where'd we end up? I took a wrong turn, and we ended up, and God sent an angel and got us out of there. I think I've given a testimony about it. But it's amazing. And we hear about Los Angeles. You know, I'm a Dodger fan. Dodger Stadium is in the worst area 
in the Watts district of L.A. So we've been out to California two or three, four times, and every time we go out there, Mary says, you want to go over and see the ball game or see the stadium? We see it from the interstate. I said, no, this is close enough for me. I can watch them on TV. What I do is I go up to Cincinnati and watch them when they come visit the Reds up there. Um, but I'm not going down to the Watts District of, of Los Angeles. I know better than that. And crime is so rampant. I don't care where you go. There's a bad side of every city. It's this side of that city. It's this side of that city. And everywhere you go, it's the west side of Louisville. There's wickedness everywhere. It is widespread wickedness. Verse 5 says, God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth. It means it was abundant. And not only widespread wickedness, but I call it perpetual perversion. Why do I call it perpetual perversion? Look at this. And that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart, of his means man, from the first phrase in verse 5 here, and every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. You know, we're cautioned when we speak and write about using words like... um, Every, only, continually. We'd be cautioned about using those words. But guess who's using the words? It's God. God has the authority to use the words because He is the truth. And here's what, here's what God says about that day and time. Not only was there widespread wickedness, that was their deeds or actions, but look at their thought life. Because that's what we either, we either see what they do, or we don't know what they're thinking. But those are the two sides of our life, the things that we do and the things that we think. And it says here that how many, how many of the thoughts of man, every imagination of the thoughts of man. Now imagination refers to our thought life. That's what the word refers to. It's our thought life. Uh, literally, it's, um, it's our purposes, our desires, uh, it's, our, it's our mind. It's the things we're inclined to do. It's our motives. It's our ambitions. It's, 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 it's that which is our thought life. It's our mind. That's why in Romans 12, 2, it says that we need to be, that our mind needs to be renewed in Romans 12, 2. And why in Philippians 2 and verse 5, it says that we need to have the same mind in us which is also in Christ Jesus. Because the natural mind is wicked. Jeremiah, if you ever want to do a study on imagination and thoughts, go to Jeremiah. He has the imaginations of the heart are only evil continually. I mean, it's bad stuff. The, the heart is desperately wicked above all things. It speaks of the, of the thought life. And even Jesus talked about, inasmuch as you think to commit adultery, you've already committed it. So it says here that not only was there widespread wickedness, but there was perpetual perversion. The word at the end of the verse, continually, and what what does it continually refer to? It refers to the evil. The evil what? The evil thoughts in a person's heart. So every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. There's nothing going on good inside the head. I look at our society today and I wonder, People that aren't saved by the grace of God. Their thought life isn't right. It's not right. What are they, you, ever, you ever look at some of these crimes and say, what were they thinking? I mean, I was looking at a video today where somebody went in and robbed a store. Or tried to rob the store. As the person was robbing the store, there was a guy standing behind him who was a trained uh, marine um, Big bulky guy, he just sort of grabs him and throws him down to the ground and holds him there to police get there. And you got to think, what was he thinking? I think the caption on it was, uh, you might want to check to make sure that the Marine vet is not behind you when you rob the store. But people don't think because they've got their mind set on this wickedness and this evil. They're distracted from the reality around them. And it's, it's, you heard the stories about all these dumb criminals who do all these dumb things because they've got something on their mind that's not good and <clears throat> they're going to get caught. And they do. And they do. So not only uh, the actions and deeds by way of their wickedness, but also their thoughts were evil continually. And it says every imagination, every one of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. That was the prevailing condition in the day of Noah. No wonder God destroyed them. 
Is that what you think? What about America? You know, and, and, and what we understand is it, what happened in the days of Noah by way of destruction was an example for us of what happens when people do that. And it doesn't mean that our society is going to suffer the same. People say, well, you know, God owes Sodom and Gomorrah an apology. He doesn't owe anybody an apology. Because what happened to Sodom and Gomorrah is what's going to, the same thing is going to happen to the homosexual society today. So, in our text verse, it says that their judgment and their damnation does not linger or slumber. It's coming. It's coming. It just doesn't come in our, in our timing. But it's coming. That's why God says, leave vengeance to Him. Vengeance belongs to the Lord, not to us. We shouldn't, we shouldn't jump the gun and say, well, you messed with a member of my family. Oh, yeah? So that's another one of those where God's Word says, and we think, well, maybe there are some circumstances where God's not right. Somebody messes with my family, I'm going to take vengeance. Well, guess what? If everybody thinks that way, the world would be full of crime, right? Everybody would be doing their own thing. We're also to be responsible citizens and obey the laws that we have over us. And that means we can't go and execute people ourselves. We leave that up to the. We say, well, they don't do a good job of it. God's going to do a very good job one day, and nobody's getting away with anything. That's the point. So, we have this widespread wickedness. We have this perpetual perversion. Uh, because their minds have not been renewed. They don't think uh, like the Lord thinks. And so what we find also, it says in verse 7, uh, excuse me, let's go to verse 12. Verse 12, it says, And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt. <laughs> Can you believe it? It was corrupt. <laughs> um. The word corrupt means morally degenerate. That's what it means. Morally degenerate. And perverted. And perverted. And that's the conduct. God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt. For all flesh had corrupted His way upon the earth. Widespread wickedness. So now we look at verse 7. So what did God do? In verse 7 it says, And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, and the creeping thing, and the fowls of the air, for repent of me that I have made them. You know, we look at situations today and where we, maybe you, you see a section of a body of water and all these dead fish are washing up on the shore. Or maybe uh, there's a uh, a disease, you know, that hits uh, that mad cow disease just destroyed, you know, thousands and thousands of herd of cattle. And there are things like this happen in our society. And, you know, we can't pinpoint and say that's God's judgment and that's God's judgment because it rains on the just and the unjust as well. And we understand that. Um, and it's not, nece and not necessarily because the person sinned, because we see Job himself. And it wasn't because of his sin that God allowed the devil to test him. Right? But uh, there are many occasions, and perhaps many more occasions, where it is because of sin. And we look around our society today, and it's full of wickedness. And it's corrupt. It's no different today than it was in the days of Noah. That's why a lot of people now are trying to predict the end times are about to begin. Because it looks pretty much the same. And it does. But also the Bible says that we can't predict the day. No man knows the hour nor the day. And as we talked about in our adult Sunday school this morning, if you're there, is, you know, sometimes it seems like we're in a race and Christians are to, think, to be the one to say, I did it, I picked the one, I picked the date. That's why there's so much date setting and why there's so many people trying to be identified as the Antichrist. Because people are trying to be the first there. Even that is a matter of pride and doesn't belong in the body of Christ. <clears throat> but this wickedness... Um, is certainly going to bring destruction. If you look at verse 13 there, it says, And God said to Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence. Filled with violence. You know the thing that, I mean, every time, and I've said it many times before, the thing that hits my mind when I see filled with violence 
is our, t- our television and entertainment industry has promoted violence, and that's what people want to see. If you look at the top five TV shows, that's, where, that's what's there. If you look at the top movies, if you give them violence, if you give them sex, if you give them profanity, that's going to sell more than anything else, and it's a proven fact. It just sells like crazy, because that's what people want to see. As we're approaching what the world celebrates as Halloween, all these scary movies will come on, and they'll come out with some new ones, no doubt, and people are always going to see these scary movies. Why? Because there's, a, there's an appetite for violence in our society. And so we get surprised somehow and amazed uh, and stand in wonderment when it happens all around us on college campuses and high school campuses and you know, in the streets of, of Louisville and everywhere else in our society. Uh, but it, it shouldn't surprise us because we even use it for entertainment. And then we, so we, we go, take this scenario. I believe the average Christian watches their violent shows on TV, and then they go to bed and they say, Lord, and they start addressing the Lord to protect and to provide safety and health and watch over my family and our church or whatever it might be. Noble prayers, but Psalm 66, 18 says, if we regard iniquity in our heart, God's not listening. So we can't sit there and leave all this violence that we just used as entertainment and then go to the Lord and expect to get full attention from the Lord on all of our requests. And oh, by the way, most of our requests are what we want and not even, I think the average Christian doesn't even submit it to the will of the Lord. They just want their will done. Unlike Christ. need to be like Christ. Christ-like, in fact. And... So what happens is we have all this wickedness. It's all around us. We're living in a corrupt society. Now look at verses 17 and 18. And this is the destruction and the devastation that is brought about uh, in the days of Noah because of all this sin. And it says in verse 17, And behold, I, even I, this is God speaking, I, even I, understand who it is that brings the judgment and the destruction. I, even I, do bring a flood of waters upon the earth. And, you know, before we go much further, how many people, even Christians, try to explain away the flood? Well, it didn't really happen that way. You know, there was uh, the moon got this way, and the tide got that way, and, you know, with some quirk. It had never even rained before. And people don't even want to admit that, because that destroys their theory. So you say, well, you know, somebody said, well, you know, it rained all the time. You know, it never rained before. They sort of, you know, dumbfounded. And they just ignore you and go on. Because they've got their own opinions made up. Heresy, right? But it says here, I even I do bring a flood of waters. Who brought the flood of waters? God did. We don't have to worry about where it came from because God told us He's the one who brought it. He brought a flood of waters upon the earth. Why? To destroy all flesh. It wasn't just something that happened. It was judgment upon the widespread wickedness and corruption in the world and the perpetual uh, perversion of people's minds. That's why God brought the flood. And He brought it for that specific reason. To destroy all flesh wherein is the breath of life. Everything that had breath, God destroyed it. And He says, from under heaven and everything that is in the earth shall die. Of course, we understand that he spared Noah, who was a just man, and his family. So in verse 18, it says, But with thee, that is Noah, I will establish my covenant, and thou shalt come into the ark, thou and thy sons and thy wife and thy sons' wives with thee, and and of every living thing. And in verse 22, Thus did Noah according to all that God commanded him, so did he. In the midst of this widespread wickedness, of this perpetual perversion of the truth through the minds of people, through the corruption that it just washes across our world, we need to stand true to God's Word, just like Noah did. Guess what? Noah was the only one. Now we understand that there were some other times in Scripture people thought they were the only one, but God has a remnant. But that doesn't mean that we can look around and every, you know, Every person we see is going to be saved. In fact, Matthew chapter 7 tells us that few will find the straight and narrow path and be on it. Most people will die and go to hell. 
most people will die and go to hell. It's a fact of Scripture. So if most people are going to die and go to hell, and it's a pet peeve of mine, then why? And I was talking to Brother Tom before the service, and he went to one funeral, preached a funeral. I said, you didn't preach somebody in heaven. I'm just joking. He said, no, I'm not preaching somebody in heaven. He says, but Rosie went to a funeral where they did preach somebody in heaven. Because the average person believes that their family who's dead is in heaven. <clears throat> Some think that if they were a fisherman on earth, that they're fishing in heaven. and you know They were in the choir on earth, they're in the choir in heaven. They just think uh, heaven is just some continuation of the life here. Uh, aren't you glad it's not a continuation of the life here? <laughs> and me too, brother. <laughs> Let's go back to our text verse as we wrap up here tonight. Um, Go back to 2 Peter chapter 2. And what we see there in verse 5, it says, And spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness. We didn't talk much tonight about the fact that Noah preached for 120 years to an ungodly world and nobody listened. Somebody told me the other day, he says, you know, I'm just all discouraged because people aren't listening. I says, well, join the crowd. <laughs> nobody, nobody listened to Noah. Nobody listened to Jeremiah. He preached for 30 years and not one convert. So the number of converts doesn't matter. What matters is he was a preacher of righteousness. The results are left up to the Lord, but in a world of wickedness, God's not going to force his himself on anybody we're not puppets on a string where god just yanks some of us out we have to we have to respond to his call as we talked about this morning so uh, god wiped out all the living things it says there uh, in verse five he spared not the old world he spared not the fallen angels in verse four he spared not all of those people now we'll close with this thought so there's all these people on top side of earth who say, oh, but God is a God of love. And so he's not going to do those things. The biggest lie the devil has ever tried to sell. And there's lots of people that have bought it. And they sold their soul for it. <clears throat> God is a God of love. And we know that. But he's not just a God of love. God is holy and he's just and he's righteous. And because he is just, those who... Those who come to Him in faith and those who obey Him are rewarded appropriately. Right? But those who turn away and reject God, they are dealt with harshly because God would not be just if He let people get, get by with sin. And so how many sins will send you to hell? Same number. <laughs> Same number. Of course, I don't know of anybody who could live their entire life and only sin one time. For we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. <clears throat> and Christ died for our sins, plural. The good news is that for those who put their faith in Christ, He wipes away, as far as the east is from the west, all of our sins. <clears throat> They're gone. They're gone. And God forgives us and He forgets. And there's a clean slate. And that's the love of God. And, and but every, every unbeliever who ends up in hell had God's love commended towards them, and they rejected Him. Romans 1 tells us that. All mankind stands guilty before a holy God if you don't put your faith in Christ. And even creation itself exudes with the uh, wonder and amazement of God's truth and His creation and His love. But when you reject His love, <clears throat> it's not a pretty picture. False teachers fall in that category. They may stand in the pulpits every Sunday. They may be on the television from day to day. They may be on the radio. They may be lifted up by the community. They may have large followings in big churches. They may author books and have big speaking engagements and very, be very popular and seemingly righteous. But the devil himself, he transforms himself into an angel of light and his ministers do the same thing. And so there are people today... In, there are many, many, many false teachers today as we've read through the books of the Bible and studied them, and we take it too lightly that they're out there. 
We need to be careful not to follow because many follow their pernicious ways. We've got to be careful not to follow. You know why? Because you can come into a church like this or another church. There's a lot of churches where the word is being preached. And you can come into the church and you might not get all the fanfare. You might not get all the entertainment. You might not get all the feel-goodism. I'll give a new term to it. You might not get all that feel-goodism. And you might be attracted to a church where that will make you feel better. Make you feel better about yourself. And here I, I think people see, they see the church. The church. And the church over there, and there's a church over here, and why should I go over there? They're both churches. They don't know the truth of God's Word, that there are false teachers out there who have uh, different motives, and they're not right. And they follow their pernicious ways. And there are many false teachers, and there's many following the way. I believe when the Lord raptures the church, there's going to be a lot of churches that are going to have the pews filled. Uh, and few, few pews will ha- be empty on the next... Now, there's a lot of Christians, don't get me wrong, but by way of the vast number, I think there's a lot of pews that won't be missing a person on the next Sunday morning. And so they're going to be wondering, and that's why there's going to be so much wonderment, because most churches will still be filled the day after the rapture. And so people won't understand what's happened. And uh, because the saved will not be left behind, period. They will not be left behind. Christ is coming for His church. And if you're saved by the grace of God, you're leaving when He comes. (laughs) We won't precede those who are dead in Christ first, but we're going to be raised up and join Him in the air and forever be with the Lord. That's a good note to end on. Let's stand together. Father, we thank You for teaching us through the power of the Holy Spirit uh, the presence uh, and the pervasiveness of false teachers in our world and in our society, in our country, in our city. Uh, and Father, we just we thank You for giving to us understanding and knowledge and discernment and wisdom uh, to know the difference. And Father, may we always stay close to Your Word as good students of the Word to know the truth and to know error when we see it. And Father, we just thank You and praise You for the Word that You've given to us and for that ability to understand it, knowing that there are great gems of wisdom within it, and You will not let Your children be without it. Uh, as As we ask for wisdom, You will give to us liberally if our heart is in the right place. And so, Father, we ask that You continue to feed us from Your Word and give us that clear understanding so we can discern our circumstances around us, not to be persuaded by the false teaching that's going on today. And as many are drawn in to that crowd of false teachers, we pray, Father, You continue to protect Your children that they'll not be led astray or enticed to join that crowd. We thank You now for everyone that's come tonight. We ask that you'd give us safety throughout this week. Bring us back at the next appointed service, and we'll give you praise and thanks for it. For it's in Christ's name that we ask it. Amen.